Is Nederland 1 met een uitzending van de BOS, de Boeddhistische Omroepstichting. U kunt kijken naar een programma over componist Philip Glass en zijn leermeester Gilek Rinpoche. I call students a friend, and rather than students, that's my personal style, and everybody's friend. Um, number one, if there is no karmic connection between the two person, the teacher and the student, uh, it's not going to work. It doesn't help. And. Uh, that's the number one choice made by karma, a karmic connection of both student as well as the teacher. There are many teachers, but uh, I was fortunate to have met two very remarkable teachers. Gilek uh, was the second one, but his friend was the first one. But that's, you should know that it's not unusual in Tibet. It was all not unusual to have two teachers, maybe, in fact, Galakumshe told me once, you said you had studied with 40, 30? Yeah, 39, 40. Yeah, so it's not unusual to have that. But to have a very, uh, there may be one or two who be most important. Uh, and I've been to hear many people speak, but I would say that uh, these two are the ones that are most important for me. The teachers who were actually born and trained in Tibet. Uh, this is the last generation. Uh, and if we are fortunate uh, enough to meet uh, uh, a teacher with that background and training, uh, it, it's a unique opportunity. The next generation of the people younger than us, uh, let's say the people that, like my children, my, my, I have a little boy, he won't, he won't be able to study with someone like that. They won't be there. You have to remember, people who grew up in Tibet we're in a culture that was totally Buddhist. I don't think you went to the movies in Tibet. Well, I did go. I did oh, see you did? the yes. <laughs> See, that's what I mean, he's a funny guy. <laughs> that's funny. Yes. But, uh, and, uh, about this uh, transmission thing, I'd like to say something. The true transmission is the true development within the individual. But then, you know, on the other hand, there's also like um, initiations. So when you did complete the ritual, that is that one type of transmission. And then there's an oral transmission, which is when you heard the sound, that is the oral transmission. <laughs> The next 
mechanism of trans transference comes from person to person. That's true also in music. Uh, it must be true. I think it probably is true in dance. It's probably true in poetry. Uh, it, it's a direct uh, transmission from person to person. Uh, in order for that mechanism to happen, you have to cultivate that relationship. They talk about the medicine, the doctor, and the nurse. The nurse is the sangha. The doctor is the teacher, and the medicine is the dharma. Uh, but these are all things that uh, you learn after a while. But uh, one of the most thing, the difficult things uh, to, to understand for us, because it's not part of our culture, and it becomes more difficult, but the idea that transmission happens person to person. In my case, because it happened in music long before I met any teachers, I understood it right I understood that. I understood it because it happened in my life in that way. So I was able to clearly see it. So when I finally met at the age of 30, I had had 22 years of, of guru relationship, but in music. Jewish mostly, with numbers, the numbers were on their wrists. Mostly there were older ones that I met. I was very young, I was about eight or nine years old. They were scary. When I had to leave Tibet, I was not hanging on on my old position or property or wealth. Number one, you are forced to go so there's a strong force which cut everything because you've been kicked out. And you've been not only kicked out, you have to, you've been kicked out by, you know, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away. So that is number one, forcefully cutting. And number two, of course, it is the Buddhism that helps tremendously because here you know it tells you all the time, it is impermanent. It is here now, it will disappear next. And it is not here now, it will appear again. So I've been taught that since childhood, read, and I've been repeated. So when it actually happened, you have to realize and let it go. Every fear for me is not necessarily bad. Now, for example, if you are afraid of the suffering in the lordoms, and then that is the cause of taking refuge. If you fear the samsara's suffering, that is the cause of seeking liberation. And uh, if you fear the, my friends and the families and all other, what do we call that, mother sentient beings are going to suffer in samsara in general and uh, particularly Lord in sufferings, that is the cause of a developing body, mind, love, compassion. So there is a good part in the fear, and a normal Western understanding, saying every fear is bad, is not true. There are some, maybe it's bad, but uh, you can make use of it. Very helpful. The actual communication comes through the teacher. The living teacher is considered more important than the Buddha, because you can't meet the Buddha, but you can meet the teacher. So the transmission is not going to happen through Sakyamuni. He's been gone for 2,500 years. We have the words, 
Through his words, we have the Dharma. The Sangha is also incredibly important because it's the power of the Sangha, the power of the community. Uh, it kind of, it, uh, how can I say it? It makes much more intense the practice. There's no alarm or something, right? When the smoke comes, sometimes the alarm goes. I think if fears are overcome when you gain wisdom, the ego fear combination. The, you know, ego for me is a false me, false I, and the which sort of dressed in the fear, and uh, you carries the hatred and the obsession in the right and left hands, and they fight, and that's ego to me. So fear and the ego are almost coming together, which is we get confused. The confusion is not knowing. How far is she from the church? How far are you from the church? Maximum five people. Yeah. Fantastic. And so vegetarian, we're vegetarian. They're all vegetarian. Yeah, we're all vegetarian. That makes it easier. Mm. When I first came to that St. John's Church, yeah. and uh, you were playing that night and, in New York City. Um, New York City, and then I asked you uh, whether you can come and help me to set up Jewel Heart. Yeah. And uh, then you were very kind to accept the invitation. And we had Alan joined you. Yeah, that was a big help. And that was a great help. And they both came to Ann Arbor. And uh, since then, Philip has been to every year concert for Jewel Heart to raise a fund. And uh, because of uh, Philip and because of Alan, and a number of other artists are also very much uh, uh, involved. Uh, Clementi. Uh, Francesco Clementi of the Italian. Patty Smith. Yes, he's also been very helpful. Patty Smith is very... And uh, Laurie Anderson came. And Paul Simon. Paul Simon. Cosmopolitan meetings stand up against governments against God. Stay irresponsible. Say only what we know and imagine. Absolutes are coercion. Change is absolute. Ordinary mind includes eternal perceptions. Observe what's vivid. Notice what you notice. Catch yourself thinking. Vividness is self-selecting. If we don't show anyone, we're free to write anything. Remember the future. Advise only myself. Artists are very motivated very often to communicate with other people. And they, many people who do music or painting or writing, they want to uh, be helpful, to make the world to re better in some way. You want to leave the world better than you found it, if you could do that. If you leave it worse, then that's not good at all. If you're neutral, it's also not very good. In a way, you can say, if you didn't do anything well, then what? you didn't make any use at all of your life. We have to we have to go. Good. Let's Hi. go. Let's go Russian. Let's go Russian. I also do. Or is it you want the piano on top of you? That's fine, no good. I'm glad you made it. Very nice, thank you. Yeah, Philip.
You're not allowed to touch the piano. Oh dear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I think Philip wants to try a little bit. <laughs> Music, I do music. In a funny way, you can say, oh, it's mixed up. In a way, it is. But when I'm doing music, I'm not thinking of anything else. And maybe it'd be better if it wasn't like that, but that's how it developed for me. And uh, what I can do is use the music like tonight to make an introduction. So the music becomes very useful. This church was built uh, 900 years ago, which was about the same time that Atisha and Miller Raper were teaching in Tibet, which became the foundation of what Gela Krobache teaches. So it's wonderful coincidence. I'm not going to say very much about his life, except that he was born and educated in Tibet and came to the West in the 1980s. He started the Jewel Heart in the early 1980s in Nijmegen and started another uh, group in the United States in the late 1980s. I'm going to play the piece that uh, I wrote for the Dalai Lama's first public address in New York in 1979. And the piece has become identified in my mind with this kind of event. Uh, so that's what I'm going to begin with. We call the piece Mad Rush. I was once talking to my other teacher, Geshe Rinpoche. I call him Geshe Rinpoche. I asked him, I asked him once, I said, uh, uh, I, I understand there are 3,000 realms of existence. Is one of the existence made up of music? And he said, definitely. He said, I mean, he said, definitely, definitely. And he said, uh, I said, is it possible to be reborn in that realm? And he looked at me and he said, absolutely. You have, he said, with, he said, no, he said, hopefully. <laughs> That's not the same as definitely, it's hopefully. I'd like to thank you, Philip, that not only your introduction and uh, beautiful music, and especially making very special trip this time, all the way from New York to here this morning, and uh, going back, well, probably tonight or tomorrow early morning. <laughs> thank you. And, um, Somebody asked me this afternoon, how long it took for you to write this book? And I said, 60 years. And that's, that's what it is, because of 60 years of my studying in the Tibetan Buddhism, I'm now trying to make it a simple, straightforward, easy way. Even a high school kids 
can read and understand. If you look in the English title, it says, good life, good death. The good life to me, life that is meaningful and worthwhile, worth for yourself and people who are associated with you, like your own spouses, children, parents, including mother-in-law. So that's a good life. He's talking to a public who may not know anything about Buddhism. So talk in a way that welcomes people to the ideas, but there may not be very much detail in the talk. Uh, but it works extremely well for this kind of place. But he also uh, has detailed knowledge of, uh, of, of the practices. And, uh, and a lot of that has been recorded. Uh, uh, and um, people who have spent time with him, you'll go over the recordings again, and sometimes they've been made into books. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done with the material that he has left. Uh, this group in Holland has been very good at that. Uh, many of the lecture series have been turned into books which are circulated within the community that he works with. That is a, such a funny thing. People don't want to talk about it. People would like to hide. Yet everybody is want to know. It's almost like, you know, they close one eyes and tell me, Tell me quickly, you know. <laughs> that is basically our attitude. Alan Ginsberg called me. So I said, hey, Alan, how are you? He said, well, I'm busy to tell you the truth. He said, normally, when, if, it's, if it was me before, if somebody tells me, you're going to die, I'm going to hit the ceiling, no doubt about it. He said, today, in my own surprise, he said, when the doctors came up after test, they all have a very gloomy face. So I told them, cancer, and they shook hands, hats. And I, and I told them, told them, they're still not smiling, so I, st I told them, incurable and they shook their heads again. And then I, still they are not saying anything. So I said, soon. So they said, three to four months. <laughs> so he said, well, I was sort of relieved, he said. I was relieved to know. I was not angry. So I'm preparing, and I prepared my life, and uh, thanks to you and to Murumbiji. I was there when he had the stroke, he was unconscious, and uh, I went the next day. I reached there till about uh, quite afternoon, around about 4.30 or 5, and uh, his room was completely filled up by those great poets, musicians, and uh, painters and movie actors. There's all kinds of drinks and Chinese food and uh, sandwiches and everything on the table. And uh, when I walked to Alan's place, Philip was there since the morning, sitting there doing his own projects there. So then I came in and, um, and uh, I hold Alan's hand Talk to him a few minutes, but he's unconscious. But it reminded him. And then I started my own uh, self-initiations of a Hiroka, or Chakasambara. And about two, he died. He finally left. And then I continued as long as his consciousness was in his body. So till what well, next two days. So we continue to hear some projects.
So he died extremely peacefully. His Holiness the Dalai Lama once said, he was talking about uh, the signs of death and the death experiences. And uh, you probably know this, uh, uh, their practices in what is called uh, preparing for the Bardo state, that's the stage in between. And there are definite specific practices for, uh, that you prepare for that. And he said once, he said, uh, well, I've been practicing all my life for that moment. I hope when the moment comes, I don't blow it. <laughs> so if he says that, then what can I say? <laughs> Good death for me, that a particular ordinary death may be transformed and a becoming extraordinary death of changing the death into a very meditative state of uplifting the dying individual to a enlightenment level. So that is good death to me. But many people may not be able to achieve that. And uh, this is Buddhist broadcasting, so I'll be happy to say it. So when you don't achieve that, then the second possibility that the Buddha offered, offered to us is the transforming your consciousness to a pure land or something which is normally known as poor. If you are incapable of transforming the death into a Normally, in Buddhist terminology, what do we call it, dharmakaya. Um, if you cannot, and then the poor is the second choice. And if, even you can't get that, then uh, you'll, be, you'll be, be dying in the thought of a positive, virtuous in nature by remembering Buddha or by remembering your guru, by remembering uh, compassion, body-mind, specifically, or wisdom, the emptiness, or faith, and any one of them through which you can make the transaction is also a good debt. I was married to a Tibetan woman named Dezila. So she passed away this January. Uh, so I was in India about three weeks. At the time of her last breath, and I was seeing Vajra uh, Yogini projects, and uh, it's sort of really uh, the world where the Vajra Yogini may take all sentient beings to her pure land. At that very moment, she breathed the last. So it was not attempted, but all that type of thing a lot of wonderful things happened. De volgende BOS Televisie uitzending kunt u zien op zondag 29 juni om 2 uur s middags. De BOS is ook op de radio te beluisteren en wel op radio 747 AM vanavond om 5 over half 8. En morgenavond om 8 uur.